So, um, yeah, fatigue. Okay, good. Uh, thanks a lot for giving the chance to speak. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about this uh, recent paper that I wrote with uh, Kumran Wafa, Sergei Bukhov, uh, and Georges Obi. Uh, Georges is a student at uh, Harvard. He's Kumran's student, and he's an excellent, excellent graduate student. He he actually taught me most of the stuff about this uh, this topic. So, um, and uh, so I, maybe I should start with uh, setting expectations. So uh, I don't want to present this as. Uh, um, a finished product, but rather a work in progress. In particular, um, the particular realization that, that we propose in the paper is probably not the most compelling aspect of the story. Um, and so the phenomenological implications we are, are more of sort of as estimates and uh, um, as guidelines for what sort of this, this whole framework could give us. I think the more, the more interesting part is uh, the motivation and the, also sort of the uh, the clues that tell you why we want to study such a such a phase of uh, gravity, and so um, I'll spend some time on analogies which motivate uh, studying these analogies and uh, studying this uh, phase of gravity, uh, and then I'll introduce uh, topological gravity and uh, and uh, provide uh, give you the estimates. But really, I would like to emphasize more the aspect of this detective work of finding uh, uh, the appropriate topological uh, phase. Uh, I should also say, please uh, interrupt me with questions anytime. Um, I'm happy to try and answer them as they come up. Good. So let me let me start with the motivation. And uh, this is probably not this list is not uh, shared by may, maybe my collaborators, but this is the, this is at least my motivation for doing this. Uh, my primary motivation is to understand the following statement that the graviton can be understood as a nabu goldstone boson of some kind of uh, symmetry being spontaneously broken. Uh, this is, um, at least the, the paper I learned this from is, in, uh, is a paper by Witten in 1980s uh, on topological quantum field theory. Uh, and, uh, and the idea is that whenever we talk about gravity, we are expanding around some sp space-time background. Uh, and we're talking about uh, einstein hilbert action as governing the waves uh, propagating on that background. And in particular, we're not allowed to take the metric going to zero limit. Uh, and we don't actually know how to make sense of that limit. And so uh, this is, you know, this language is very similar to how we describe spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, where we, you know, expanding around some web and then we're expanding our gold stones around the, uh, the particular web. So the, the primary motivation would be to try and understand what this underlying symmetry could be. And what this uh, sort of un unbroken phase of uh, gravity could look like, and and indeed the idea would be that it it it, uh, it may be this topological phase of gravity. Uh, another angle that provides a motivation is the idea of uh, um, the idea of duality in string theory, and so of course we know that dualities are ubiquitous in string theory, and particularly one lesson that we learn uh, is that the same effective field theory does not describe extreme corners of string theory. So here I've taken a, um, a picture from uh, this paper by Uguri and Wafa uh, in the context of the distance, con uh, of the distance conjecture of the swamp plan. And the idea here is just, if you look at the moduli space of string theory and you take some moduli to extreme values, um, you find different descriptions of, of the theory. In fact, in the distance conjecture, the statement is that there are tower of light states uh, that come down from the UV cutoff, and so you have to change your effective field theory description. So we don't expect a single effective field theory description to be valid in various extreme corners of the theory. Um, and uh, if you think about the, the very high temperature limit of the uh, of the universe, uh, and if you think about the temperature as the Euclidean circle on which you're doing com computations, then going to going to extremely high temperature sounds like one of these limits where we're taking some um, taking some limit of a, uh, of a modulus going to extreme limit. So it is perhaps not uh, unexpected that we, we might encounter kind of some kind of duality or we might encounter some kind of a new description if you really push the universe to an extremely high temperature uh, phase of our theory. So, hey, Victor. Hey. Um, and finally, there, there, there are, um, there, there are some, more recent, there's some more recent work on uh, trying to understand the sitter space as it arises in string compactification. And there's a whole uh, slew of uh, desitter conjectures and their variants um, that I think, I think it's fair to say are speculative. 
uh, but they argue that desitter phase or some, some phase which is very close to the desitter such, such as inflation is hard to realize in string theory. Um, so if, if taken seriously, then they would also ask, you would also wonder if inflation is hard to realize in string theory, how do we actually, uh, how, do we, how would you understand uh, the fate of the early universe and all the big bang cosmology puzzles? Um, but like I said, I, 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 would, I, I would say it's fair to say that these conjectures are somewhat speculative, perhaps, perhaps uh, interesting to explore. So, um, so with this motivation, I'll, uh, this, is, this is a plan we'll follow. Um, I'll start uh, by giving you a toy analogy to gravity. This is something probably many of you in the audience have, have seen me talk about before. So the first, the analogy is scalar gravity. And this, this sort of provides us with a concrete example of some of these ideas that, uh, that I'm saying in, uh, in more abstract terms. Um, and really sort of the, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice playground, but then we'll see that the sort of, that's where we can be most concrete in terms of what we want to do. And to find the analog in spin two gravity would be the slightly more hand wavy part of it as you see. Uh, then we'll go and uh, motivate early cosmology as an ideal playground to make connections with these ideas in phenomenology. Uh, and I'll very briefly talk about string gas cosmology to just provide the language for what, what we're going to talk about in topological gravity. Uh, I'll uh, briefly introduce topo topological gravity as a realization of this early unbroken phase of gravity. Uh, and, uh, and finally, I'll provide some phenol uh, uh, estimates for uh, uh, cosmological fluctuations and perhaps more importantly, um, try and draw some qualitative lessons so that even if um, this is not the particular realization of these ideas, maybe any such realization we might hope that gives you uh, the same kind of qualitative predictions that this gives. So that's the, uh, so the, so the lesson we would want to draw there would be hopefully be more universal. So let me, let me start with, um, um, let me start with the scalar gravity analogy. Um, the, Famously, gravity is a very, very special theory, and we don't have very many limits to study it. It's very, very, it's, it's very unique, and it's basically fixed. Uh, but scalar gravity uh, provides a nice playground for, for a lot of ideas in gravity. And the theory is actually really simple. It's a theory which you define on Minkowski space. Uh, it's, a it's a CFT, which is uh, studied in the spontaneously broken phase uh, with some scalar operator phi getting a web M. Uh, this this web M, that's the spontaneous breaking scale of this theory, is interpreted as the Planck scale for scalar gravity. Um, and uh, as is probably familiar, that once we break uh, spontaneously the CFT, we break the five conformal generators, but we get one pseudonab one Nambu-Golson boson, which is the dilaton, and this dilaton plays the role of uh, the scalar graviton in this theory. Uh, we can parameterize it in this exponential form if we want, or or in this sort of uh, uh, in the form of this pi field. And the scale transformations, it transforms as you'd expect the Goldstone boson of scale transformations to, uh, to transform. Um, the pi transforms the shift symmetry, for example, but the, also being the space time symmetry, uh, the argument also transforms. So before I sort of justify why we should think this dilaton theory as a theory of scalar gravity, but notice this one thing that the main feature that we're after is very explicitly realized in this theory. The, the graviton in this case is very explicitly a Goldstone boson that comes out of spontaneously spontaneous breaking of the CFT. So we have a, uh, and we already have a, have at least a candidate for the, what the theory is, what the underlying symmetry uh, of unbroken gravity is. It's the CFT in this case, and the Goldstone boson of that symmetry is uh, uh, is, is our scalar graviton. Uh, why 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 should we think of this as a theory of gravity? We can. Uh, Perhaps one, one transparent way to see that is the following. We can, um, we can construct an effective action for the, for the dilaton without specifying what the CFT is just by the nature, but just by, just as we construct the Carla Lagrangian uh, for QCD, just by its symmetry transformation properties. And this is what, at least if we just, for the second worry, for a second worry about classical, uh, the classical dynamics, then it just looks like Lagrangian with no, um, no mass parameters. So there's, a, there's actually, um, so there's Yukawa couplings that are allowed, and it's a, uh, there's actually a lambda phi to the fourth term that's allowed uh, in the case of uh, 
the dilettante, which is uh, which is a little novel from the point of view of Goldstones, usually we don't write any, um, usually we're not allowed to write any potential term, but in this case we are because it, it's uh, because of the scaling symmetry. And this effective action can actually be cast in a geometrical form uh, where we identify uh, phi squared atom mu nu as the metric of this geometrical formulation. And we can, to get into the, get into this form, you rescale uh, all your matter fields uh, by the canonical dimension with phi. But once you've done this, um, you can actually write uh, this effective action of the dilaton in this generally covariant form, uh, in, a, in a geometrical form. And uh, this phi to the fourth term actually looks like a cosmological constant term from this point of view, uh, which if you really wanted to study this theory around a flat background, you would set to zero if you wanted to really study a spontaneously broken phase. So uh, in the spontaneous broken phase, this would be zero, but in general, just from the low energy point of view, this is allowed. Uh, and so you can, so, so th this is in fact like the first theory of uh, gravity that Nordstrom wrote down, the scalar theory of gravity. Um, and, this, and the fact that it's a dilaton uh, is, the, is precisely the reason why you can convert this scalar action into a geometrical looking action. You can't of course do this for any general uh, scalar field theory. And there's, there's more than just this manipulation, there's actually deep familiar ideas that we usually ascribe to gravity that are actually uh, find, a, find an analog in this theory of scalar gravity. Uh, there's some analogs of black holes. Um, if you think of this scalar uh, of the CFT as some large and gauge theory or some kind of gauge theory, and they're localized uh, plasma excitations of the sort of quark gluon plasma excitations, which are metastable and they radiate hadrons at a slow rate. And they have properties very similar to, to black holes. And in fact, theories which have ADS-CFT duals, these states are interpreted as uh, black holes localized in the IR of the ADS space. So, so, so in the light of ADS-CFT duality, maybe it's not as surprising that a lot of geometrical features emerge in this uh, uh, spontaneously broken CFT theory because it just, you can imagine, you can sort of think of it as inheriting these geometrical features from its ADS dual and the, towards the IR, it's described, those features are described by a, well described by a CFT in the spontaneous broken phase. Sorry, but they, they are black holes in the sense that they, this metric induced by the scalar field has a horizon? Or... Sorry, say that again, I didn't catch it. This, 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 what you call black holes, they actually have horizons in the scalar graph? No, well, yeah, so, so they're, they're, these are, they're, so what we're doing is just, uh, quantum field theory and flat, flat space time, right? So they don't really have anything from, so from the quantum field theory point of view, we just have full control over the whole theory, which is sort of part of the reason it's useful as an analogy. So what these black hole objects are here are just, uh, just the restored phase or the deconfined phase of the CFT. So there's just quark gluon plasma and there's nothing, nothing sort of very spectacular that happens apart from this phase transition from quark gluon plasma to a confined phase outside, the, outside this region. So from the, from the point of view of phi squared atom mu nu metric, something really dramatic is happening. Your phi is going to, your sort of space-time description it seems to be breaking down and, uh, and but, but from sort of the underlying quantum field theory point of view, there's nothing really special happening. So it's not, of course, we, we can't start with a quantum field theory without gravity and end up with horizons and so on as we, uh, but, 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 the, but then it's interesting that there's objects just in quantum field theory that, that sort of have these analogs. Um, um, there, oh, sorry. I, I, sorry, Peter, question. Oh, sorry. Hi. Yeah, no, I just uh, following up on that because I've always wondered. So, so can you describe again the what? I, I think I missed what you were just saying, which is wh why do you call them black holes? I mean, what what is sort of in interesting or useful about them? Um, well, yeah, I guess I guess the, the 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 black holes they're called they're called black holes because so if you if you start from a point particle in scalar gravity. And so let's let's imagine a point particle which has a Newtonian uh, Newtonian field which is one minus one over R. So far away, it looks like a Newtonian potential. But as you go to the Schwarzschild radius of this theory, you get sort of close to phi equals zero. So the the sort of this, this driving your the the wave of your spontaneously broken phase to z to zero. So at at basically the Schwarzschild radius in this theory. Um, from your scalar gravitation point of view, something dramatic is happening. So it looks like sort of point particles are actually, you don't actually get to get do point particles. That's at Schwarzschild radius, something dramatic is happening. 
so you could you could you know this is nomenclature you could say that i don't think these are black holes so i'm i'm you know but they're, they're just sort of the same um there's, there's properties which which sort of you would let you led you to lead you to believe to sort of identify these as black holes and in the ads cft there actually are sort of the black holes in towards the ir localized black holes in the ir are these plasma excited excited plasma deconfined phases so right so i mean yeah it, at least at the some some level of analogy you might you might uh, uh, got you it might yeah let, perfect let it pass that these are black holes yeah yeah no thank you yeah um, there's also actually a version of a cosmological constant problem in this uh, scalar gravity theory, which has, again, analogies with the spin to cosmological constant, and that's a story for another day. Um, the, uh, I've, I've sort of described the theory so far in, um, in a very classical, uh, in a very classical sounding way, but you can do quantum corrections in a consistent way. The fact that it's, it's a spontaneously broken CFT ensures that any sort of consistent quantum correction and regularization, renormalization the procedure you employ will preserve this, uh, the equivalence principle and the geometric picture of, uh, of this theory. Uh, even though sort of by, by eye, it looks like lambda phi to the four should generate a quadratic divergence for the, uh, for the phi field and you should get a mass. But indeed, if you uh, impose a renormalization scheme consistent with the UV CFT that we started with, you indeed, of course, does not, do not generate, a, uh, generate any, um, uh, any of the disallowed terms for scaling symmetry. And to, uh, for, for model building, if the, uh, there's, an in, there's a perhaps useful and elegant implementation of this idea where this can be implemented as a, as a RS model, but with no UV brain. So you just have RS model, which is then spontaneously broke. The ADS space is cut off in the IR by some uh, IR brain, and that signifies spontaneous breaking. Um, and uh, um, and then the, the dynamics of that position of that brain are just the, the this this dilaton or the radian degree of freedom. And if you tune the cosmological constant on the brain appropriately, you can place the brain anywhere. And so that's sort of the limit of scalar gravity. Anyway, so that's so 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 indeed there is some reason to think that this theory is a uh, is a is a good analogy to gravity. And we can ask uh, then what happens uh, to cosmology in scalar gravity. So just, in, just to use the language of large and gauge theory, um, the spontaneously broken phase uh, is uh, analogous to the confined phase of the, of the, of the gauge theory. And the, the deconfined phase, just as I was describing these quark and gluon plasma balls, are the, are the unbroken phase of this gauge theory. And um, in this theory, the Big Bang uh, is the confinement transition. So you, you started your theory in a deconfined, in the deconfined phase, and then there was uh, a confinement transition. Um, this would set off, this would set off uh, uh, a phase in which this phi field is well defined, and you have you have gravity. And in this confined phase, there is a scalar gravity space time metric, as we were describing, with a non-zero value of phi. And in, in fact, if phi is not phi is not stationary because there's matter fields. The phi would actually evolve with time, and that just looks like a that that looks very much like the scale factor times eta mu looks very much like FRW cosmology. So, in fact, after the as you enter the confined phase, you would enter a phase of FRW cosmology, and you'll measure your lengths in phi squared eta mu, and you would just have regular cosmology. And phi of t would actually be your cosmic time. So, the phi would uh, phi would measure time in your theory. And indeed, if you ask the scalar gravity person what happens if you go to the uh, uh, deconfined phase, it seems like you lose meaning of time because phi itself is going to zero. So scale factor itself going to zero kind of thing that we would imagine as, our, as we go back in time. But from again, from this underlying quantum field theory perspective, there's always uh, some space time and we're just describing different phases of theories in, uh, in the deconfined and confined phase. So, the, the notion of scalar gravity space time though breaks down uh, in the unbroken phase. Can, can, I, can I ask you something? I'm a bit confused by your terminology. Why are you using this confined versus deconfined? So if, uh, uh, I mean, isn't it just some scalar field getting a VEF that, that breaks the, yeah, I mean, the formal invariance? I mean, in some really simple right. realizations like n equals four. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. I guess it's just sort of uh, uh, confined. Confined doesn't matter here very much. Yeah, I mean the, the examples I'm thinking of 
like this RS model, really the, the phase with the the phase with the IR brain is usually the, is what we call the confined phase. So in ADS CFT type examples, uh, the deconfined versus confined phase is really what I have in the back of my mind. But for this for this discussion, I think there's there's no there's no reason to call them that. If it's if it's really this large engaged theory with the IR brain, then then really you would have the deconfined phase as you know at some at some temperature you would have a black hole phase of ADS, which you would call the deconfined phase. And then the IR brain phase would be the confined phase. And that's the phase where the symmetry is spontaneously broken. So it's just sort of familiar term terminology from these transitions in, uh, in ADS-CFT is why I'm using them. But, but you're right, I should just be saying unbroken and broken phase for just the purpose of this discussion. Because they have the same energy, right? Basically, I mean, the point is that the, yeah, the, the, what you call confined phase and deconfined phase, there is uh, the, the energy, whatever, free energy or something of the theory is the same, right? Because that, uh, because you don't have any explicit breaking of uh, scale and light. It, it, um... So it is the phase transition is a function of just some wave of some field. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, other, yeah. I mean, confined, deconfined. Well, okay. Any, anyway, okay. I think I understand what you're saying. Right, right. I mean, yeah, I, I agree that it, the, the confined, the confined doesn't really have to. I mean, I, I see what, you, what you're worried about that if without any breaking, um, we'll sort of is there that usually you would expect there's, there to be some free energy difference between the confined and deconfined phases, but here it doesn't seem to be. Right. And you could, you could even work in sort of a metastable situation where you have, we, we, could, we could break enough things to, to, to have things under parametric control, but broken so that we can actually talk about this in just sort of RS-like cosmology. So you really have like a thing which is slightly broken, uh, and uh, and you could have the you could have the um, you can start the universe in a deconfined phase, but in a metastable vacuum, and so then you tunnel to the confined phase. Sorry, you can start the universe in a deconfined phase in a metastable vacuum, and you can tunnel to the confined phase. Yes. Um, and uh, and and that there tunneling is, no, is what I'm describing. Well, I, there is only one scale in the problem, right? Which is the like a, I mean the wave that broke the, uh, yeah. the and and so that's is that what you would refer to this as a confinement scale? Yeah, is yeah, yeah, true? yeah. Exactly. So that the wave of that the wave would be the confinement scale, um, in in this uh, in this language. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pratik, can I, can I ask yes. something as well? Sorry. Sure, of course. I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm not, I, I thought the reason why you chose this confinement, deconfinement terminology was because the phi degree of freedom really doesn't exist in the, in the um, unbroken phase. I mean, it's not like there's a field that is picking up a VEV and that's what's going from the CFT to, to the broken CFT. Isn't it more correct to say, the this entire description breaks down. It's completely a new set of degrees of freedom in the in the in the unbroken phase. Yeah, yeah. In fact, in yes. fact there aren't. I mean, you're you're gonna there there are there are vastly fewer degrees of freedom in a sense in your broken phase. Right. I I think I think yeah that I think that's a good point that uh, it was it's not just a language crutch but it also has this feature that shows that. Um, that there are that the, the, this these this phi doesn't really exist. It's sort of a glue ball from the point of view of this uh, um, gauge theory point of view. So so there it becomes slightly more clear that the degrees of freedom in the confined deconfined phase are completely different. If you just had a elementary scalar, as John's pointing out, John is pointing out phi equals zero still has those degrees of freedom. So it's not as it's not as visceral of an example to show that these degrees of freedom just don't exist in the other phase. So thanks, yeah, that's, a, that's a good. The, the reason I'm getting confused is that confinement for me is like a phenomenon of explicit breaking of conformal invariants. Uh, and, and here we're talking about a spontaneous breaking of conformal invariants, which is not a feature of the Lagrangian, right? Confinement is something, I mean, the theories that confine, theories that not confine. And that depends on the Lagrangian that, that we write down in the UV. Uh, and, and here is different, right? Here is a, there is a, some theory with some you know, Lagrangian and, uh, and it has a moduli space, right? Uh, it has a, a flat direction. In the mm -hmm. origin of this flat direction, theory is conformal. Indeed, there is no, there is no diloton because there is no theory is scale invariant, there is no diloton. Then if you go along this way, I mean, there is some other field, not phi, some other field that tells us that 
you know, we can give it a wave and go along this valley. This valley is absolutely flat, so energy doesn't change, right? And this yeah. is where you get spontaneous breaking, and, and indeed you get a, yeah. a, a gold stone. I mean, same as right. for Mexico head potential, you know, the difference is only that there is a, instead of head, there is it's absolutely flat. But the point is that same as with Mexico oil symmetry, you go to the valley, and okay, there is some composite degree of freedom, which is a gold stone, right? Which basically yeah. translates you along this valley. But anyway, right. it's probably sure. just terminology. I don't think you. Would be but I mean, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know how precise, I mean, formally precise the statements are. But usually in RS, in RS models, we, um, I mean, in the end, realistic models don't have spontaneous breaking. But in RS models, you, we, we interpret the position of the IR brain as spontaneous breaking and as confinement. But you're right. It, like if you, if you actually turn, like if you re literally had a C. So I don't know if that situation is ever replicated in any realistic model that you have an explicit flat direction. Maybe in supersymmetric models, I'm just not super. Yes, in supersymmetric. Yeah. I mean, in all normal. In supersymmetric in models, you could, yeah, you just like sort of, uh, yeah. So, but 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 in RS models, that that the existence of the IR brain is is interpreted as uh, both spontaneous breaking, and as the confining phase of the gauge theory. But but okay, but that but but like like you said, the terminology is not. The ter most terribly important aspect of it, the, the 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 aspect that John was emphasizing, that I think you were agreeing in these examples as well, is that this phi itself loses uh, loses identity in the unbroken phase. There's no in the in the in the restored in the symmetry restored phase. There's no notion of the phi itself. So so maybe that, that yeah. So so that so that's sort of the the. the it, 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 I don't, yeah, I don't know how precise it is. At least, if with with, with enough uh, enough bells and whistles, we can make this slightly more precise. But but usually in these RS models, we think of this dilaton as a glue ball and uh, the spontaneously broken phase as the confined phase of uh, uh, of some gauge theory. But 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 which it's not usually specified which gauge theory. So it's it's a very sort of just the five deconstruction is the proof of the existence in some sense. Uh, but yeah, so those are the two qualitative features that I would take from this example, though, that in this unbroken phase that we want to study, we would like, we would, we would expect, first of all, that there should be no notion of this Goldstone boson itself. So there should, that should be a phase where there's no propagating graviton degrees of freedom. And in fact, the whole notion of space time itself uh, should, uh, is expected to break down if we take this seriously, uh, take this example seriously, just like the this notion of five square eta mu new space time is just breaking down in the unbroken phase of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, scalar gravity. So, um, so, so, that, so, 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 so that was my sort of motivating studying this topological phase from scalar gravity. I see Victor is not completely happy, so maybe I should pause for more more questions. No, no, you shouldn't hang up on this. I'll, 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 think, I'll ask you in the, in the end again. Okay, to... cool. So that was that was all I wanted to say about scalar gravity, but but again, that the reason I spent so much time on scalar gravity is because here I can say things more precisely, and I I don't want to necessarily point to the example we chose as the example, but I want to sort of motivate and uh, inspire thoughts that would that that tell that at least convey what features I think are 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 interesting from 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 these points of views. Okay, so. Um, so we want to study this phase and, 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 um, and a natural place to, if you want to make a phenomenological connection with this phase is the early universe. Uh, first of all, if you want to study our fundamental interactions like the electroweak symmetry uh, in any other phase than the broken phase, we go to early temperate, we are go to early universe and the, and the implications of restored electroweak symmetry are, are apparent in high, high temperature. So, uh, so, so just studying different phases of our theory, it's, it's a natural place to go to the early universe, but also the, the puzzles of inflation, like the horizon problem or the flatness problem and so on, um, actually push our, the phenomenological considerations of cosmology to the very earliest epoch. And so um, if, if it weren't for these problems, then we probably wouldn't be spending so much time on model building at inflation at the gut scale, we would have just no information past BBN and anything, probably anything goes before BBN would be the, would be the statement. So, so the fact that we have this, these problems in cosmology actually let us engage with the very earliest epoch in the universe. And so these are, this is a natural place where you would uh, uh, connect with this topological phase of gravity. So, so 
So, so this is just to motivate that the very early universe is the place where you would go and look and maybe connect with phenomenology of this phase of gravity at very high temperatures. And of course, inflation, inflation is uh, a very elegant and, and a calculable formalism uh, to explain all of these cosmological puzzles. And so here, um, from this point of view, the, the, the successes of inflation, we would say is that it's a very effective, very good effective description of the early universe. And, and so that sort of, a, that explains why, um, why inflation is uh, perhaps successful. Uh, but here we're going to imagine that instead of inflation, this topological phase is the thing, is, is what was going on in the early universe. Again, the detailed phenomenological implications I don't think are fleshed out enough to take as seriously as some of these qualitative ideas. But I hopefully you will find these qualitative ideas interesting in their own right. Okay, so um, before I go on to topological gravity, I want to spend a very short time on uh, string gas cosmology, which was introduced early uh, in the early uh, in the late eighties as um, as an actual model for uh, what early universe cosmology could look like. Um, but that's not what we're going to talk about. We're not we're not going to consider this as an actual model, but just as providing us uh, with a useful analogy. And the idea of the uh, string gas cosmology was motivated in part by the t by t duality in string theory. And um, just to review, um, the in, in string theory, if you define it, the, the, the theory on a compact space like a torus, uh, we have both uh, uh, momentum states, so these closed strings, which are small closed strings, as well as winding states, where strings which are going all the way around the torus. And the, um, the momentum states mass go like one over L, uh, where L is the size of the box, and the winding states mass go like proportional to L. And uh, there's a dual coordinate, the Fourier, Fourier transform dual coordinate, dual to each of these uh, notions of uh, uh, each of these states, P and X. And in fact, there's a T duality where uh, we can take L to one over L and exchange the winding modes and momentum modes. And so what was, uh, what was sort of a local description in terms of the momentum modes in one frame in the dual frame is, is local in terms of the winding modes. And these dual vari the, the the local, uh, the locality is uh, in one frame is manifest in this X variables, whereas in the dual frame, it's manifest in this X tilde variables. And the idea of um, string guys cosmology roughly was that in the early universe, if the if the if if your size of the universe was extremely small, then maybe you're, maybe you are uh, dominated by these winding modes, um, which have some local description in terms of these X tilde coordinates. Uh, but as the universe uh, uh, kept inc increasing in size, uh, at some point, these winding modes got converted to uh, the the, moment, uh, the momentum modes, and uh, the early universe was described. Uh, can be this, this very very tiny uh, uh, circle in the early universe uh, is a is a very tiny circle in x coordinates, but you could describe it as well as a big uh, as a big space in x tilde coordinates, with some local effective field theory on this, but in terms of x tilde coordinates. So, so a good effective description of the early universe was in these dual x tilde coordinates and not in x coordinates. And, and as is probably familiar with any uh, case of duality, these x and x tilde coordinates are mutually, not, mutually non-local. There's no local transformation from one to the other. So something that's local in x tilde coordinates as was the case in the early universe is completely non-local from the point of view of, of, of the x coordinates. And so this, this would sort of give you an initial state which couldn't have the, the whole pro even the problem of horizon uh, super horizon modes was just not uh, you couldn't even phrase it because the early the early universe state was intrinsically non-local in x coordinates to start with so this is sort of again this is the only feature that i'm going to use from string gas cosmology that that as you go to the early universe you maybe go to a dual phase which is mutually non-local with our phase and so the question even of super horizon correlators uh, at, at the sort of initial big bang uh, epoch is is just not applicable because the early universe phase was not described by the same local physics as our phase. Um, so this is, yeah, so here is just to say that um, uh, the T duality is just an example duality. This could hope, hold more generally and uh, we could have some local operator O from our point of view. Uh, and this, this could become sort of analog of a winding mode in early universe, which is phase one here. 
uh, but it's light like a photon in the, or, a, or an electron in our, in our phase, which is phase two, which is FRW. And starting in phase one, we're only populated in the zero mode sector of these, uh, of, of our particles. And, uh, and then once at, at, some, at some epoch, uh, there's a phase transition between uh, this early universe phase and our phase, and then all these modes get converted to RKK states. So, so this is again just set in pictures where uh, this origin is the epoch of this phase transition. The time up to the right of this is just FLRW phase space time where we're populated by these um, by our photons and gravitons and electrons and so on. Uh, but these modes were uh, were were very heavy. They were the analog of winding modes in the in the early universe before this phase transition. And there were other modes which were the dual to R modes, which were light, which got converted to R modes. So this is sort of a cartoon picture of what, what ima we imagine is going on. And from the point of view of our matter fields, the early universe phase was topological. And indeed, if you think about, if you, if you now, if you take this picture uh, seriously, then, then this conversion from, from uh, winding modes to KK modes, uh, would have correlations which would be super horizon. There would be no notion of uh, locality in this original phase. So when they convert in this phase transition, there's no there's no expectation that they would only produce local local correlations or local fluctuations. So this so this is the sort of very very crude picture, uh, which would explain why we start with a sort of universe uh, homogeneous universe in our local in our local uh, variables. Um, and in this in this uh, picture, even gravity is uh, undergoes this duality. So even the graviton uh, uh, in this picture would be uh, would be analog of a winding mode in the early universe. And so the, even the gravitational sector would be a, would be uh, described by a topological field theory at low energies. And um, so so this is the sort of picture we want to realize. And what we use is Witten's 4D topological gravity as a realization of, uh, of this idea. Can I ask a really dumb question oh, sure. just at this stage? Yes, I mean, still at the analogy stage. So uh, in our actual universe, uh, I know that most of the energy density uh, in fluctuations is contained in the zero mode, right? Like any, uh, any fluctuation, super horizon or sub horizon, these are sort of down by whatever, 10 to the five, or depending on how you normalize. Um, so what is selecting out that, like I would naively expect that as your phase one matter shifts into phase two, you know, the phase one modes become light, the phase two, uh, or sorry, the phase two modes become light, the phase one modes become heavy. I would expect that there's nothing that preferences out the zero mode uh, in the phase two matter, and that I would get sort of order one super horizon fluctuations on all scales. So why do I not get that? Like what is what is setting this scale of 10 to the negative five? Oh yeah, yeah. So so um, it's a good question. And this is the part where we sort of I maybe show the estimation of where the fluctuations come from. And and I think that the fair answer is that's not it's not entirely clear. I can I'll say some words, but I don't know if it'll it'll answer your question. Uh, Entirely, but let me just say that when I say zero modes here, um, when I say the zero mode here, um, right. So, so, so there's two things. One is one is when I say the zero mode here, it's 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 a, it's a uniform mode as you're imagining. So, even if it even even if it uh, converted to arbitrarily high energy particles. You would still solve at least one problem. Let's worry about the size of fluctuations later, but you would still solve the problem that the temperature in this part of the universe and the temperature in that part of the universe, which naively were never in causal contact from FR, FRW point of view, are still the same on average. And now, now you're asking when they're converting, why are they not converting to arbitrarily high fluctuation? And and indeed, that's you know they are converting to very high, very high. Uh, even if they're converting. With small level of fluctuation, the momenta that you get is the reheating temperature. So indeed, you are getting very high momenta once the conversion takes place. And your question is more like if if averaged over certain regions of space, are the fluctuations 10 to the minus? If I average over, let's say, 100 megaparsec scale, then the, are the fluctuations 10 to the minus five or not? Right. Mm -hmm. 
as opposed to so it's not the case that after after translate after this the space transition you only end up with zero momentum modes from zero spatial momentum modes from our point of view you get high energy modes um uh, as they become accessible to these uh uh so as our as our modes become light then uh, and there's some certain reheating temperature all of those reheating temperature modes will get populated so we would certainly not just have population of the zero modes uh after the phase transition but on average what we would like is the temperature is the same super horizon scales and the fluctuations in this temperature is 10 to the minus 5 not that the overall temperature is small right and so so indeed it's not the case that we would only populate sort of uh zero modes it's just only populate things which were zero modes so what should I, how should i say it so they were only zero modes here which were and there any any excitation of them were suppressed but as as you, as you get to the fr fr w phase you get all all high momentum modes populated consistent with that reheat temperature oh, oh, okay sorry so so i i think i understand that statement but also all of the modes that were populated in your phase 1 sector so the modes that were light in phase 1 and are now becoming heavy yeah these modes should be decay right these modes should be transferring their energy to phase 2 matter that's what they're doing that's exactly what is happening yes uh, and i th- those are the ones that i'm confused as to why those should not transfer their energy into whatever arbitrarily uh, like it seems like there's an immense amount of energy density there that I, it's not clear why i should expect that the dominant uh energy density is set by the original zero mode becoming um of it, the the original zero mode of the phase 2 matter why is it not set by the decays of the phase 1 matter No, it is set by the decays of the phase one matter, but the phase one matter is in the zero mode sector of our of of uh, from our point of view. So the zero mode sector just means, say, for example, constant across the universe, right? And indeed, phase two matter, if you think about a winding string, would be constant across the universe universe from our point of view. So the initial energy density is all stored. It's not zero, but it's stored in zero modes in sort of. Uh, things which are not uh things which don't have momenta spatial momenta from our point of view and those are the precisely those things that are getting converted right. so you imagine like a big string and just fragmenting and a big a big qcd string fragmenting a big qcd string fragmenting would just leave to get give you a spray of hadrons and they would all they would sort of break in some random yeah, pattern okay. but it would break over all over the place and not just at one point somewhere so you'll get super uh, sort of horizon correlations only there i i understand okay thank you so uh yeah so that's at least the cartoon picture that i have in mind um good so right so so this is this is sort of the the thing that we want to implement and we will consider 4d topological gravity as a realization um and indeed witten proposes his top 4d topological gravity partially as maybe a perhaps realization of this idea of unbroken unbroken phase of gravity So let me let me quickly introduce to you what topological gravity is. Uh for the topological gravity is um topological theories have no local excitations. Uh and so for example in 2D the Einstein Hilbert term is a pure uh is is a pure topological invariant and so it just measures sort of not local features of the geometry but how many handles you have and things like that. And so there's no local excitations and lo- local local uh degrees of freedom. So local questions like signal propagation etc uh are meaningless in topological theories and uh indeed these in this theories there's also the case that there's no local stress tensor uh and so if you really thought about this as uh again going back to our analogy of um the dilaton being the glue ball of or a or a gold a composite of this unbroken dynamics uh you would worry about things like weinberg witten theorem which tell you that gravitons can actually not come from a theory cannot sort of be composites thought of in this way even though the symmetry is not not a not not any kind of familiar symmetry but still you would worry about perhaps worry about the weinberg witten theorem applying but the fact that this is a topological phase gives it maybe more credence as a uv completion of gravity because there is no local stress energy tensor in this theory so it does not at least run enough out of uh the weinberg witten theorem in that sense um so the the kind of theory the topological theories we will consider or the to- topological gravity theory falls in this category are called witten type theories Uh and the idea here is uh 
uh, perhaps best understood again with some an example where uh, there's an example of a topological quantum field theory, which is uh, n equals to uh, n equals to quantum theory, quantum field theory, n equals to supersymmetric quantum field theory. This n equals two theory has equal numbers of bosons and fermions, and there's some supersymmetric operator Q that enforces the equal number of bosons and fermions. Uh, if you take the uh, R symmetry, SU2 R symmetry of this uh, n equals two theory, and you take one of the SU2s of the Lorentz group. So if you think of the Lorentz group SO4 as SU2 plus SU2. Um, so you take one SU2 of the Lorentz group and SU2 of the R symmetry and call the diagonal of this SU2 as a Lorentz, Lorentz generator. So you sort of twist the Lorentz symmetry by this SU2 symmetry. Then this Q actually becomes a, a BRST operator in this theory. And, and so the, so every, so just like the supersymmetric theory gave for every boson, a fermion, you'll get a ghost for every physical degree of freedom. And so when you're, when you're minus one to the F, trace over minus one to the F, partition function was canceled, it was going to zero. Now your partition function itself goes to zero. And so essentially, just like in supersymmetric theories, you can have this BRST type operator that uh, pairs every degree of freedom with, every, with a ghost degree of freedom so that you actually cancel off all degrees of freedom and you're left with a topological field theory. And this BRST operator is, of course, familiar from sort of gauge theory context where you start with a certain number of degrees of freedom, but the BRST operator gives you a certain number of ghosts, so it kills off some number of degrees of freedom. So these Witten, Witten type topological field theories are created in, the, in, a, in this very sort of supersymmetry like fashion where you try to find a Lagrangian, which is entirely BRST invariant and, and, and ends up with zero degrees of freedom uh, with the degrees of freedom canceling uh, in this BRST sense. As, before, as, usual, as is usual in the case, this BRST charge operator defines this cohomology class where we identify things which are, uh, so alpha and alpha plus Q times beta are identified and uh, physical states are which kill Q, uh, which are killed by Q. So essentially the idea is that you kill, kill off all degrees of freedom. So you start with any theory that you like. And you, if you find enough, uh, if you find ghosts, then you can, you can actually close the algebra by this BRST transformations. You found a degree, you found a, you found a topological version of that theory. So indeed, this is how topological gravity was constructed. You start, you want to, if you want to construct a topological theory of gravity, you start a theory with, of a tetrad and you start with a, um, uh, the self-dual version of the conformal uh, of uh, of wild gravity, and uh, and you you do you take the variation of the tetrad with respect to this BRST operator, and uh, you see that you need new ghost fields to cancel out those degrees of freedom, and th when you add those to the Lagrangian, you need further degrees of freedom to cancel off those degrees of freedom, and so just like a, a, the building a supersymmetric Lagrangian from ground up, where we add something and we see that we need to keep adding things until hopefully the algebra closes. This is what sort of the procedure uh, that was followed in, for example, Witten's paper where um, you do, once you add all these degrees of freedom, you actually find that you can actually get a BRST invariant Lagrangian with no degrees of freedom left over. And so that is a, this wild gravity plus a bunch of these extra fields, which will not play a very big role for our discussion is what is topological gravity. Um, and the Einstein-Hilbert term is not generated by the variation of any of these terms. So you, you there's no, uh, the BRS, you can get the BRST invariant Lagrangian without any breaking of scale invariance and there's no Einstein-Hilbert term. And so the, the interpretation would be that the unbroken phase is this phase where, uh, where we get, uh, where we have topological gravity and then that there's a spontaneously broken phase uh, where, um, where the usual Einstein-Hilbert action emerges and we, we're living in a spontaneous broken phase of this topological invariance. So, so the uh, um, the in order to preserve topological invariance, just like when we look at variation of uh, fermionic fields to see which what backgrounds we can uh, implement supersymmetric theories on, we ask the same question for here. And what we find is that uh, uh, the wild tensor vanishing is the condition for topological invariance of the background. So we'll start. So this this theory, in order to have topological invariance, has to be studied in wild, in conformally flat backgrounds. Now this by itself does not give us flatness. And so it's not just by the, just this condition is not enough to give us spatial flatness of the early universe that, that you would like early universe cosmology to give us. But 
uh, but it gives us conformal flatness as a uh, as a as an input, and then um, with additional assumptions, perhaps one can make uh, one can even make uh, spatial flatness come out, but it's not it's not at least naturally coming out of this this uh, this condition so far. And finally, the the uh, it, it turns out that we do end up with the BRST invariant Lagrangian, but uh, but it's not satisfactory as a quantum as a as an as a Lagrangian for a quantum theory. Because there's there there are fields like some of the field C, which was one of these fields that uh, I wrote, and some components of this field psi, which don't actually get a kinetic term in this BRST invariant way. And there's no scale invariant and BRST invariant way to write down a kinetic term. Uh, so what Witten proceeded to do was to add a BRST singlet capital phi, which signified some other matter sector that was not part of the so it was some BRST invariant matter sector that this theory had to be coupled to. And a non-zero background value of phi was required to, to give masses to these, um, uh, to do, sorry, give kinetic terms for some of these fields. So, so just by itself, so, so this is where sort of he left matters where it wasn't clear uh, which, what this phi should be. It should maybe be some other gauge sector that you could couple this theory to and there's a bunch of possibilities. And indeed the topological gravity wasn't, so topological gravity and topological quantum field theory came out like a couple of months apart in, uh, uh, in 1988, and one and one of them has a has 2,000 citations, and this has 100 citations. So this is this is sort of a trail that wasn't followed very far uh, uh, comparatively. So so this was where sort of he left matter, saying that maybe we want to construct some explicit examples of this phi's, and maybe and his his motivation was to actually construct analogs of these Donaldson invariants that you that you construct in uh, quantum field theory. So some topological invariants of manifolds from a uh, physics point of view. So, so this, is, this, is, this is in summary what, uh, what the stereotopological gravity is. There's some, uh, the, the boson, the gravitational part of the action is just a wild squared action. And there's actually in fact an overall, uh, overall constant uh, that is, that is uh, left uh, free. Um, backgrounds that preserve topological invariants have, uh, are conformally flat. And there's, a, uh, there's an additional sector uh, that you need to add, which has a BRST invariance massless field phi, um, which is like a matter sector. These are the, sort of the uh, coarse grain features of the theory. Uh, and we want to understand what this implies for cosmology, uh, or at least to try and extract as much uh, as much uh, we can from this from this theory. And I think uh, the lesson the qualitative lesson that I was promising you early in my talk was, it, I think for me is that the fact that any such phase would have, wouldn't have a graviton propagating degrees of freedom, um, which is maybe even a definition of the phase. If there was a graviton, then this, then it still falls in the category of a spontaneously broken phase with a propagating goldstone. So even, so almost definitionally, if you want to set, if you imagine the early universe to be in such a phase where uh, which is sort of topological and an unbroken phase, then that that phase is very likely not having not does not have a propagating degree of freedom, a graviton degree of freedom. So that that corresponds to not having a tensor mode uh, of fluctuations when you when you look at fluctuations. Gee, could I so ask I would, a question? Sorry, can I just ask a question here? Yes. yes so yes. Um, if we're going to try and relate this to cosmology, presumably we need some theory where we can evolve from this topological phase where uh, we don't have these things to the uh, universe as we have now where we have gravity. So the topological yeah. gravity theory you've been talking about, I don't, it, it's not, presumably not set up to have that property. Is there some reason to think we can have a theory where we can evolve from one phase to another? Um, let, I, yes, so let me answer that in a slide. I think probably okay. the next slide would answer it, maybe not directly, but then let me, let me answer it in the course of the next slide. Okay, cool. Yeah, so the short answer is that we don't know, that's the theory we would want and we don't have a formalism to doing that. And that, if we had that formalism, that would not, that would then allow us to just predict cosmological observable, observables directly. And I wouldn't be waving my hand so much and waffling on what these predictions are so much. But let me tell you what sort of, I think of, I think this would look like, uh, these predictions would look like. I think this, Analogy is probably not uh, not very enlightening for this audience. It's probably obvious to uh, everyone in the audience. So let me just skip over that in the interest of time. 
Um, so, so what we, so precisely what, what Robert was asking about was how do we actually implement this conversion uh, in, in from, the, from the topological phase, this theory of topological gravity that describes gravity in this early phase to, um, to RFRW phase. And this is again, the analogy of, uh, in, the, in the scalar gravity case, what this was, was a phase transition. So there was, again, a, uh, if Victor is not going to get too angry at me, this, is, this would be the deconfined phase and there would be a confined phase on the right and there would be a phase boundary between them which would be sort of the domain wall that, that separates the, the bubble wall that separates the deconfined phase and confined phase. And that phase transition is the analog phase transition that we would want to implement in a topological gravity. So there's some spontaneously, bro spontaneously broken phase that we want to end up in as FRW. Uh, and so we want, so we, it's precisely this setup where we want to consider a phase transition and probably what we, the, 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 the thing that would answer Robert's question is the a theory on the domain wall of, or the boundary uh, bubble wall of this phase transition is the theory that we would be after. And, um, and so, so what we actually want is an effective, is a theory on this, uh, if we have the theory on this uh, transition wall, then that might give us, a give us an initial condition, which we could then input to FRW and then go from there. And, and notice this now, the, notice this sounds very much like how we do these calculations in, in inflation and then thought of as DSCFT, where we think of the end of inflation as this future infinity boundary. And we imagine a field theory defined just on that future infinity boundary. And just by symmetry, prop, that field theory is not something well-defined or it's not something unitary or anything, which is all we care about is correlation functions in that, in that field theory on the future infinity boundary. Uh, and just the, the kinematic symmetry properties of the field theory give us two point functions and so on. And so the hope would be, which, which is not, which I unfortunately cannot uh, uh, realize as yet, the hope would be that we would be able to come up with a kind of a dual theory on this phase transition boundary that corresponds to the phase that, that separates these two phases, which implements instead of uh, the sitter space it implements sort of the kind of uh, boundary dual of uh, this topological phase. And again, the fact that the decitter phase had uh, a spin to excitation cut, translated into a, this boundary field, boundary theory having some uh, two point functions in spin, to, uh, in spin to fluctuations. And what we would like to say is that the bulk here not having spin to fluctuations would translate into not having tensor modes on this uh, putative theory on the boundary. Um, the, the way we, uh, the way we extracted, so this, I think this is the dream, which, which unfortunately is not yet realized, but, but let me just tell you how we roughly estimated what, what these scalar fluctuations would look like. I was very much inspired by this, comp these computations in sort of, uh, quote unquote DSCFT. So, you, yeah, but in, in, in inflation, so there is in, in the Citra phase, there is some clock field that basically tells you where this phase transition happens. Right. Imagining something like this here, like I don't, there are no local degrees of freedom, for example, in your topological phase. So what yeah, would be yeah. the analog of right. uh, clock so, field that, uh, uh, I know that tells us that this phase should end like what, which point, how does it know that it should end and transition to something? Yeah, else? yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's, yeah, it's a good question. I'm not quite sure, but it's very, but you notice it's very tantalizingly similar to uh, this question that you were asking about the RS case where there was a brain, but the, but the bulk was conformal. So there was no, where do we know, how do we know when we are going to hit the brain, right? It, in confinement, usually there's a running scale and we say that the coupling blows up, the QCD coupling blows up, that's where confinement is. But if it's really conformal symmetry, then what do we mean? What do we say confinement is? It's just wherever you place that, wherever you place that scale is wherever you place that scale. There's no, uh, there's no clock that's telling you that you're going to hit it. So in this, in this case, it may well be that this is just this is where that interface is, and that sort of spontaneous breaking of, uh, just the sort of the interface itself is the spontaneous breaking of the of time translation, and not the clock. Not the inflation clock that's the telling you. Yeah, it's in time. Yes, yeah, so it's harder to imagine. If in holographic setup, in ADS setup, yeah, okay, yeah. you just say you put, you can put a brain whenever you want, uh, right, right. wherever you want. But in 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 time, it's uh, it's harder. But well, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, so 
go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, John. Sorry. Well, well, well. It, I think this is a particular limit which which one, one should be aware of. Well, it's like it's like the you know strict delta function IR brain in Randall syndrome. You know that corresponds to a operator of infinite dimension picking right. up a VEV, and it's that infinite dimension that makes this, the statement. There's no clock. You know nothing, nothing, right. nothing happens. It's perfect. You know a perfect slice of ADS, and then suddenly you get even this terminating brain that spontaneously breaks. So I think possibly this is this is a similar issue. That that um, that that's an ex, you know, this sudden uh, saying there's no clock field is not quite right. There is a clock field even in phase one, mm -hmm. but it but it's somehow very suppressed. I mean, okay. you know, it's something it's something analogous to a very I mean a very large operator, um, you know, having some quantity, you know, its anomalous dimension varying slowly. Mm. Right. Yeah, I mean. So yeah, I think it goes back I, to Robert's question. I mean, one confusion thing about this is exactly, you know, what do we mean by evolving from, you know, phase one to phase two? You know, we do need right. some. Otherwise, why don't we just stay in phase one, quote unquote, forever? There's no, there's no even meaning of of time evolution, right, or any evolution whatsoever in phase one. So I think it it, it can't be exactly uh cft it has to be slightly perturbed from cft and maybe it's bust by some very you know some slowly varying uh high dimension. right and, and and in fact that i mean something some consideration like that could be fatal also i, I mean i i am fully i mean i, I worry the, the worry is that that some consideration like that would say that anytime you try and define this more carefully then you lose the topological nature and then you're not sort of in the thing that you thought you were in and so yeah, so it's, it's not True, but I think there's a notion of approximately topological. Right. So, the, so the question would be, for example, one quantitative question one could ask is, the the, thing, the reason I, I motivated mean, if one if one tries to couple something, is that right about this Witten's theory that if you try to couple some local matter to it, you'll lose unitarity? Is that the right well, statement? It, 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 it depends, I guess. You can you can just add local matter which does not participate in the PRST in, in algebra, right? I mean, you can it's like it, you can always, right? Like in gauge theory, you have some BRST thing that tells you there's these go these many goals for these many degrees of freedom. But just free, feel free to add as many scalars which don't participate at all in any of that algebra, and that doesn't sort of that doesn't do anything to your theory. It, that doesn't sort of. Uh, Spoiling any unitarity or something. The the thing mm -hmm. I would the thing that I would worry about is whether you generate induce a R term for the gravity because it, no, but we, that we, breaks the symmetry. Uh, yeah, if if you if you if you the, the reason so far we added all this bunch all this stuff but it was all BRST invariant and was mm -hmm. and R was not generated because of BRST protection. But once you generate R, then you're sort of again back to the broken phase maybe. And so maybe the quantitative and question. I, just my worry is that if you add matter fields, well, you sort of you couple them to metric, of course, by you know different variants or something. That different variants yeah, is still yeah. part of the symmetry, right? But then this coupling to metric, I well, I know nothing about this Witten theory, but it looks something very carefully designed. Uh, you no, know, and I, I would be surprised if you could easily add local matter to it without, uh, uh, you know, just remark some property that is crucial for its consistency. But yeah, I, I, yeah. Another, I mean, I think if I understood your analogy, the scalar field analogy, the scalar gravity analogy. So there was this uh, scalar field. And then I think you were imagining that there is some cosmology. We can consider some background where the scalar field is rolling. And that would look like some cosmology, right? And then when this scalar field reaches very large value, that, OK, you would say so, you so just to ask that, I thought the scalar field wasn't supposed to exist at small at early times. How how is it rolling? Well, well, okay. It late late times it exists, so okay, there is fine. some. We're in the broken phase anyway. And then at early times, the scalar field approaches some very large value, and that's where you go to some different phase where also, I mean, asymptotically also scalar field ceases to exist. But this is this unbroken phase, right? So that was the analogy. So here you say metric metric is an analog of scalar field. So yeah. some rolling cosmology, some rolling metric field. And then uh, when metric, I mean, uh, big, some big band singularity, we can say that that's where metric approaches very large values. And this is when you transition to this topological phase, right? This is 
zero. I would say zero. Well, it depends on well, whatever is zero. One, yeah. 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 Some singular yeah. values. So when metric approaches some singular value, that is when you transition to this uh, topological phase. That's and, and and in the case of the quantum field theory, there was always an underlying atom you knew that we were wrote down our quantum field theory on. So there was always a notion of time. It was only the sort of time and space time and from the phi, from the GMU new point of view that was breaking down. So in that case, you, don't, you know, we don't ask what, what is the clock that's ticking before a phase transition because we just measure time in our coordinates and then we don't measure time in phi squared atom mu new. And but everything all the matter theory. couples to, yeah, well, everything couples to e to the phi eight in new, right? So, but, yeah. mm. but Pratik, do you mind if I make a comment? Yeah. So sure, go ahead, John, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I somehow think, you know, thinking in terms of fields and Lagrangians is the wrong way to think about this because it's not really mm -hmm. formulated that way properly. Think in terms of correlation functions. And let me give you an analogy. So we know that there are uh, anions, right? In, in, in two plus one dimensions, we have anions. We have even non-abelian versions of those. No, their interactions are topological. Correlation functions for those objects are topological, the way they braid and do other things. But that's not, not totally, not absolutely. They're, in fact, um, either power or exponentially suppressed. I forget which corrections. Because really, this is descending from a theory of electrons and and you know uh, uh, nuclei in some lattice and we're doing it and this is low energy effective so we know that system it's where we have a, a well-defined notion of correlation functions for certain observables are topological but not perfectly there are tiny tiny corrections right on this thing in that, in that front we never actually managed to violate locality so like that's not doing the sort of job that this thing is supposed to do of making very non-local stuff i thought um, like we never managed to violate it at all in any sort of. Well, that's true. So I agree. The analogy is not perfect, but what I'm just saying is the correlate. Let me, let me think about okay, the correlation sure. function. So, so imagine there are correlation functions in phase one, which are almost entirely topological, and they're the only things we have access to. Right. So, oh, uh, uh, you know, maybe. May, uh, so yes, the only, the only, the only quantities we have access to are these correlations, which are almost entirely topological up to tiny corrections. And the tiny corrections are the thing which is giving you the clock. They, they are evolving in some way as we're going through. And then when we hit this phase boundary here between the two, um, then those uh, formerly tiny corrections become the, do they, they switch over to becoming by far the dominant effect. Isn't, isn't that a, a sort of picture of converting from a CFT smoothly, well, semi smoothly is the wrong word. Converting from the CFT or the early early phase to the to the late dynamical phase. Yeah, I. Um, right. So in that case, you would say that maybe R is generated, but then with a very suppressed coefficient or very high. I mean, it, it, you do generate lots sort of. Do you have? In some sense, in the unbroken phase of CFT, it wasn't that we were saying that the that there was a tiny web for the. Yeah, I, I don't know what the, the uh, approximation. So, 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 I mean, you know, the the, the t duality. If you take the t duality picture, that yeah. the 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 in our normal x the x space, the momentum space degrees of freedom, they're not mm -hmm. infinitely heavy. They're right. very heavy, right. right? But they're not infinitely heavy, right? Right. But, the, but the degrees of freedom we do have access to, the light degrees of freedom in, in phase one, they are, they are non-local degrees of freedom from our perspective. Yeah, so I think that's the thing. They're, they're non-local degrees of freedom from our perspective. There is some local physics going on, right? right. But, it's, but it's in very, very heavy modes. The, 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 the physics we have access to in phase one is non-local from our perspective. And somehow you want to say the gravity is also part of that sort of winding, like a very heavy gravity also. Yeah, so I think that's what, well, that's what Cumberland seemed to have said in, 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 in one of his things. I'm, but I, I agree, it's sort of this. Could you explain what is the role of this analogy with uh, T-duality and uh, the string? Because there, okay, I mean, I sort of understand what T-duality is and uh, it's the you know same degrees of freedom. Yeah, they have this two description in terms of winding modes and then in terms of, uh, um, 
direct space modes and okay when circle becomes too small it's better to use uh, uh, the other description but this in which sense this topological gravity is you know dual to normal local degrees of freedom it's no no so, so the statement that, is right? like, it's, it's just if, one fa like a phase uh, some heat well, well, so so let's so the statement is there's always two copies. So there's two kinds of gravitons always. So let's take the circle at a fixed size. So there's two gravitons in this theory. One is a winding graviton and one is a R, 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 R graviton, which is, the, which is like a closed string going around, small closed string going around the circle. So, so there's a usual graviton and a winding graviton. And if you make the circle extremely tiny, then the, the the, the correct description would be in terms of that winding graviton. And our graviton would become something super heavy. And so, so, so from, from our point of view, from our graviton point of view, the theory would become topological. It would just live in the zero mode of our graviton. It becomes mm -hmm. super heavy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is a local description, if you will, which is all like tilde, the, uh, tilde graviton that you could describe the theory in and so on. But those are all non-local from our point of view. So the, the, the analogy is that from our G point of view, the theory becomes topological. And as, as, as John is saying, it's not infinitely heavy. It's just sort of all those state, all those states that were, um, all those states become, become sort of, that's the size of the universe, time string scale or something rather than, um, so they're not infinitely heavy. So there, there is some First heavy all, graviton. In some known string is set up, graviton never really becomes heavy, right? You can t dualize as much as you want, but there is, uh, well, okay. But it's not the same graph. Uh, well, the, the, the one graviton that we have on a large circle that is massless, it stays massless. But not, but also, not, I'm not a that, bit, I, I also think, don't, I don't understand that's what true. is the relation between graviton becoming heavy and the theory becoming topological. I mean, Oh, it, so so first of all, I don't think it's true that our graviton is the one that always stays light. If you t-dualize, then there's a there's a spin to graviton that's light, but I think that's the winding mode that in that in that uh, language. So if you if you really sort of took our graviton, then and you, I think that the thing the way Kamran likes to explain it, if you try to measure the size of the universe, you can use two gravitons, and with our graviton you would measure L, and from the other guy's graviton you would measure one over L, and so so you. Indeed, our graviton will become heavy, and then the statement that the theory becomes topological is kind of like saying, um, if you decouple all the excitations, then it's only sort of the, the low, low energy theory is either trivial or topological. There are no the fluctuations I've decoupled in the in the EV. So it's not, as John is saying, not exactly topological, but sort of approximately topological below that scale, below this very heavy scale. So just but to ask, yeah, gone. Some, Sorry, that by T, by T dualizing, you get this Witten's gravity, or that's some conjecture that, that there should. That there should no, no, I, I don't think that. No, I think I think there is no such thing. Uh, this is just the T duality is just saying how you would think about some degrees of freedom that you like becoming heavy, but I don't think there's any such thing that any any notion that you get. Uh, I mean, usually in some no, in some simple setups, you get from type to A, type to B, or something like this, right? There is yeah. okay. No. Degrees of freedom reshuffle, but there is nothing dramatic at the level of yeah. uh, low energy, you know, bosonic degrees of freedom. So, so at least, well, again, I, I, maybe I'm reaching the edge of my knowledge about these things, but I, I think the statement. So, for, I think the statement is that this is not a t-duality that will take you from our phase to the to the um, topological gravity phase, but it's analogous in that sense, as I said. Okay, I'm, so just to ask one more question, I, where we're taking a lot of time on this, but uh, so with that example, we always has we always had some local physics, even if it was sort of uh, looked a bit different. So we always needed something like inflation to happen in that local physics to uh, actually get things to. I mean, we we couldn't set up non-local correlations on large scales without something like inflation happening because we always have the actual local physics there. Yeah. So yeah. in your example, you need something not... rather different, right? You need the local physics to actually break down to the point where we do set up the non-local correlations. No, I actually, in fact, no, I think I think I would say, so, that, so there's always, so, so we could dualize the whole story I'm telling at 
all times. And so at early, so there, are, there is local physics going on in these blue degrees of freedom at early times. And those blue degrees of freedom are topological from our, from at, at, in, in our phase. So I think, I think that was confusing the way I said it. I meant that in terms of like spatially local, so in the thing, TGI thing you were talking about, the heavy modes, like John was saying, there's still local fit, actual sort of spatially local physics going on throughout, all, you mm -hmm. can track through and you can do spatially local stuff at all times. Right. Oh, um, um, even if the, the, the space gets very small, at all times one has some spatial alert, some notion of spa actual spatial locality, where that notion of space is the same throughout. Right, right, right. Yes, I agree. Yes. But so the, all... the, que the question is that, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Karen. Yeah. No, so I was saying that I, I agree and that the, but, but then I don't, but I don't agree with the fact that we need inflation to set up non-local correlations because we have stringy, we have non-local objects already we have strings which are which are non-local objects, and so you're imagining strings are living on a very tiny cylinder, and so it isn't. I mean, so if you really look for correlations for these very heavy objects, then of course they would they would behave as you would expect. Um, All I'm saying is that to I, take I guess a I don't tiny have great intuition for how. So, uh, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Let me let. Me, let me let you finish. So all I was saying was that to take the tiny cylinder and make it into our universe, that is what we call inflation, right? Taking a small amount of space, taking a small spatial thing and blowing it up to the size of the universe is inflation. Yeah. So in that sense, one, one is setting up the, the non-local correlations via inflation in the spatial sense again. Mm. Which right. may, I, mean, I guess if you really if you really took string gas cosmology as what is go going on uh, and the size is actually the thing that's expanding I, I don't think actually that well I don't remember now but there's problems with string gas cosmology which so so literally taking the size of the cylinder as expanding as this phase transition then maybe looks um, maybe it would look like inflation I'm not quite sure about that actually but I think if you take some of, just try to like with the current matter and uh, radiation density, if you take it and just try to evolve it back with some of the W, I suspect that uh, before the size of the universe, like, and if we also assume that the universe has some compact direction, like before the size of the universe becomes of stringy scale, you'll get the energy density blowing up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's sort of the, the fact that, you know, we know that the universe is at least sort of, I don't know, Hubble size. And so, by the time A goes to string scale, the Hubble has Hubble is moving much faster with A. So, uh, so the temperature is going up much faster than. So yes, what, way before A becomes order string scale, your local, local, Hubble becomes order string scale. That is a problem with string cosmology, or at least problem with some simple picture that you're t dualizing on some spatial circle, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I don't remember if that there was, I mean, there was that issue that I don't know if that was the only issue, but they also, I think the scale invariant spectrum wasn't, that didn't come out. And so I think the reasons why string gas cosmology was abandoned, I don't know which one was the most. Um, I think they were, they were, like the original paper had a scale invariant spectrum in the strings, string frame, but in the Einstein mm -hmm. frame, it actually turned out to be some power law and not scale invariant. And I don't know what the exact setup was, whether it was, uh, um, I don't remember now what the exact setup was, but it, yeah, for, for many reasons, the actual picture of T-dualizing our universe, so one of the directions of our universe wasn't quite, that wouldn't work for, for at least for this reason that you get energy densities to be Planckian before you get uh, anywhere but small size. Here you're saying, why, why is it not say conceptual problem in, uh, in this setup? Because you're saying that this, uh, Again, large energy density and yeah, some curvature grows and, and you doing this, this dualization happens just as some stringy curvature or something that, that you don't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a sort of, uh, it is indeed the lar very large temperature limit and where you, Einstein, high, Einstein gravity starts breaking down, but there's some crossover to this other phase in the early universe. Okay, I, 
actually don't have too much more. I mean, th th this is precisely the kind of sort of discussion I had in mind for the talk. So let me just say what we sort of said in the paper. I don't, but I, I don't find this to be the most compelling aspect of the story. So in order to extract predictions, what we say is that in a sort of reminiscent of the Louisville theory, we, we, uh, we think of the effect of this sort of phase boundary. We need, we want to say there are some scalar fluctuations that are, that are, uh, that are parameterized by this dilatation mode, e to the tau 2g. And uh, we say that the, the, this action uh, for this tau field is, uh, uh, is coming from this matter part of the of, uh, Wittens Lagrangian. And we're not specifying the matter part either, but we're just saying that it, 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 it is analogous to sort of a Louisville theory where now it, it, its uh, action is just set by this, uh, the, norm, the conformal anomaly. And so it's just sort of, the, there's some C and A parameters that specify this matter sector. And uh, this, is, this is, again, I'm wearing my hands more because this is a hand wavy uh, way to get out the, uh, the answer. Um, and so this anomaly, the, the anomaly action, the anomaly functional for, for this uh, tau field is, uh, is, is written as such, and it's proportional to the C and A numbers. And uh, from, this, from this anomaly function, you can sort of estimate the scaling of the two point function. So this is the A or, A or C sit in front of this uh, tau in the action. So the two point function of tau scales like one over A. And this is again, if you look at the DSCFT kind of picture, the, the, the two point function you get uh, do scale like one over one of the central charge or one over, but in the, in, the, in the case of the, in the case of that computation, the central charges are squared, uh, uh, R squared uh, times M Planck squared. And um, it, in order to get the tail, you would also know, need to know more about the actual theory. And if you, if you imagine that it's sort of like a one loop effect with this weak coupling, then it's, uh, and that tells you that these two sort of these two guesses tell you that a should be uh, very large and and the coupling should be very small in order to give you this small tilt that we see, so that the one loop effect is sort of that c lambda squared over sixteen pi squared. So this is sort of maybe uh, I don't know how useful this is, but this is maybe pointing to what kinds of what kinds of this boundary theory we want to consider. Maybe a theory with very large number of degrees of freedom, like in the case of DSCFT, and uh, some notion of weak coupling, so that the running is actually still slow. Um, so that you get this uh, this II tilt. Um, if you take if you take uh, this particular S anomaly action seriously, then it also comes with these nonlinear interactions. And in fact, it turns out that the three point, the, if you actually calculate the three point and three point uh, non Gaussianity cancels, and you actually get four point non Gaussianities, which you can compute. But again, this is you know, I would say this is taking this particular example a little too seriously. Uh, but something along these lines is what one would like to construct with uh, all the details fleshed out and made more concrete, um, which, which, which is you know, something on my ag agenda to do. Okay, so uh, we've gone way over time. So let, let me quickly summarize. Um, topological gravity is perhaps an interesting candidate to study, to, un to study the GR in an unbroken phase. And uh, uh, we could ask if this, this phase exists and can be made sense of, does it, can it actually be realized in our early universe cosmology? And parameterizing this phase transition uh, between the unbroken and the broken phase um, will actually give us concrete handles to connect with FRW phenomenology. And um, a lot of discussion has been qualitative and, uh, um, but maybe one lesson one could draw from these, uh, this qualitative exercise is that in these examples, maybe the one thing to differentiate it from models of inflation is the absence of tensor modes. And whether this is actually borne out in an explicit construction or not would be important to study. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Okay, um, well, yeah, thanks very much, Pratik. Um, we've had a lot of discussion, sorry, let me end the, end the recording.